Hi guys, it's Melissa from Starry Family Farm. We are on June 1st for a Bible in a Year Challenge reading. We've already been doing this for five whole months. We're starting our sixth month. How exciting. So, for June 1st, the reading is going to come from 2 Kings 4 through 5, Job 10, and Romans 10. This will start with 2 Kings chapter 4. <laughs> Gotta get our Caleb in the background there. Okay. Second Kings chapter four. Alicia helps a poor widow. One day, the widow of one of Alicia's fellow prophets came to Alicia and cried out to him, My husband who served you is dead. And you know how he feared the Lord. But now a creditor has come threatening to take my two sons as slaves. This is funny. I just read this in the kids' Bible to them at the end of last week. What can I do to help you, Alicia asked. Tell me, what do you have in the house? Nothing at all except a flask of olive oil, she replied. And Alicia said, borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors. Then go into your house with your sons and shut the door behind you. Pour olive oil from your flask into the jars, setting the jars aside as they are filled. So she did as she was told. Her sons brought many jars to her, and she filled one after another. Soon every container was full to the brim. Bring me another jar, she said to one of her sons. There aren't any more, he told her, and then the olive oil stopped flowing. When she told the man of God what had happened, he said to her, Now sell the olive oil and pay your debts, and there will be enough money left over to support you and your sons. Elisha and the woman from Shunem. One day, Elisha went to the town of Shunem. A wealthy woman lived there, and she invited him to eat some food. From then on, whenever, whenever he passed that way, he would stop there to eat. She said to her husband, I am sure this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. Let's make a little room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Then you'll have a place to stay whenever he comes by. One day, Elisha returned to Shenem, and he went up to his room to rest. He said to his servant, Gehazi, tell the woman I want to speak to her. When she arrived, Elisha said to Gehazi, tell her that we appreciate the kind concern she has shown us. Now ask her what we can do for her. Does she want me to put in a good word for her to the king or to the commander of the army? No, she replied, my family takes good care of me. Later, Elisha asked Gehazi, what do you think we can do for her? He suggested, she doesn't have a son, and her husband is an old man. Call her back again, Alicia told him. When the woman returned, Alicia said to her as she stood in the doorway, Next year, at about this time, you'll be holding a son in your arms. No, my lord, she protested. Please don't lie to me like that, O man of God. But sure enough, the woman soon became pregnant, and at that time, the following year, she had a son, just as Alicia had said. One day when her child was older, he went out to visit his father, who was working with the harvesters. Suddenly he complained, My head hurts! My head hurts! His father said to one of the servants, Carry him home to his mother. So the servant took him home, and his mother held him on her lap. But around noontime, he died. She carried him up to the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and left him there. She sent a message to her husband, Send one of your servants and a donkey so that I can hurry to the man of God and come right back. Why today? he asked. It is neither a new moon festival nor a Sabbath. But she said, it's all right. So she saddled the donkey and said to the servant, hurry, don't slow down on my account unless I tell you to. As she approached the man of God at Mount Carmel, Elisha saw her in the distance. He said to Gehazi, look, the woman from Shunem is coming. Run out to meet her and ask her, is everything all right with you, with your husband and with your child? Yes, the woman told Gehazi, everything is fine. But when she came to the man of God at the mountain, she fell to the ground before him and caught hold of his feet. Gehazi began to push her away. But the man of God said, leave her alone. Something is troubling her deeply, and the Lord has not told me what it is. Then she said, it was you, my Lord, who said I would have a son. And didn't I tell you not to raise my hopes? Then Elisha said to Gehazi, get ready to travel. Take my staff and go. Don't talk to anyone along the way. Go quickly and lay the staff on the child's face. But the boy's mother said, As surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I won't go home unless you go with me. 
so Alicia returned with her. Kahazi hurried on ahead and laid the staff on the child's face, but nothing happened. There was no sign of life. He returned to meet Alicia and told him, the child is still dead. When Alicia arrived, the child was indeed dead, lying there on the prophet's bed. He went in alone and shut the door behind him and prayed to the Lord. Then he lay down on the child's body, placing his mouth on the child's mouth, his eyes on the child's eyes, and his hands on the child's hands. And the child's body began to grow warm again. Alicia got up and walked back and forth in the room a few times. Then he stretched himself out again on the child. This time the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Then Alicia summoned Gehazi. Call the child's mother, he said. And when she came in, Alicia said, Here, take your son. She fell at his feet, overwhelmed with gratitude. Then she picked up her son and carried him downstairs. Miracle, miracles during a famine. Alicia now returned to Gilgal, but there was a famine in the land. One day, as the group of prophets was seated before him, he said to his servant, Put on a large kettle and make some stew for these men. One of the young men went out into the field to gather vegetables and came back with a pocket full of wild gourds. He shredded them and put them into the kettle without realizing they were poisonous. But after the men had eaten a bite or two, they cried out, Man of God, there's poison in this stew! So they would not eat it. Alicia said, Bring me some flour. Then he threw it into the kettle and said, Now it's all right, go ahead and eat. And then it did not harm them. One day a man from Baal Shalisha brought the man of God a stack of fresh grain, a sack of fresh grain, and twenty loaves of barley bread made from the first grain of his harvest. Alicia said, Give it to the group of prophets so they can eat. What? his servant exclaimed. Feed one hundred people with only this? But Elisha repeated, Give it to the group of prophets so they can eat, for the Lord says there will be plenty for all. There will even be some left over. And sure enough, there was plenty for all and some left over, just as the Lord had promised. Okay. Chapter 5, The Healing of Naaman. The king of Aram had high admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. Now groups of Aramean raiders had invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. One day, the girl said to her, his, her mistress, I wish my master would go to see the prophet in Samaria. He would heal him of his leprosy. So Naaman went, told the king what the young girl from Israel had said. Go and visit the prophet, the king told him. I will send a letter of introduction for you to carry to the king of Israel. So Naaman started out taking as gifts 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter to the king of Israel said, With this letter I present my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read it, he tore his clothes in dismay and said, This man sends me a leper to heal? Am I God that I can kill and give life? He's only trying to find an excuse to invade us again. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard about the king's reaction, he sent this message to him. Why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me, and he will learn that there is a true prophet here in Israel. So Naaman went to his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house. But Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored, and you will be healed of leprosy. But Naaman became angry and stopped away. I thought he would surely come out to meet me. He said, I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord his God and heal me. Aren't the Abana River and Farpar River of Damascus better than all the rivers of Israel put together? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned and went away in rage. But his officers tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says simply to go and wash and be cured. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed him. And his flesh became as healthy as a young child's and he was healed. <coughs> then Naaman and his entire party went back to find the man of God. They stood before him and Naaman said, I know at last that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Now please accept my gifts. But Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept any gifts. And though Naaman urged him to take the gifts... Elisha refused. Then Naaman said, All right, but please allow me to load two of my mules with earth from this place, and I will take it back home with me. From now on, I will never again offer any burnt offerings or sacrifices to any other god except the Lord. However, may the Lord pardon me in this one thing. 
When my master, the king, goes into the temple of the god Rimen to worship there and leans on my arm, may the Lord pardon me when I bow too. Go in peace, Elisha said. So Naaman started home again. The greed of Gehazi. But Gehazi, Elisha's servant, said to himself, My master should not have let this Arabian get away without accepting his gifts. As surely as the Lord lives, I will chase after him and get something from him. So Gehazi set off after him. When Naaman saw him running after him, he climbed down from his chariot and went to meet him. Is everything all right? Naaman asked. Yes, Gehazi said, but my master has sent me to tell you that two young prophets from the hill country of Ephraim have just arrived. He would like 75 pounds of silver and two sets of clothing to give them. By all means, take 150 pounds of silver, Naaman insisted. He gave him two sets of clothing, tied up the money in two bags, and sent two of his servants to carry the gifts for Gehazi. But when they arrived at the hill, Gehazi took the gifts from the servants and sent the men back. Then he hid the gifts inside the house. When he went in to his master, Elisha asked him, Where have you been, Gehazi? I haven't been anywhere, he replied. But Elisha asked him, Don't you realize that I was there in spirit when Naaman stepped down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to receive money and clothing and olive groves and vineyards and sheep and oxen and servants? Because you have done this, you and your children and your children's children will suffer from Naaman's leprosy forever. When Gehazi left the room, he was leprous. His skin was as white as snow. Okay, Job chapter 10. Job frames his plea to God. I am disgusted with my life. Let me complain freely. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, don't simply condemn me. Tell me the charge you are bringing against me. What do you gain by oppressing me? Why do you reject me, the work of your own hands, while sending joy and prosperity to the wicked? Are your eyes only on those of a human? Do you see things as people see them? Is your lifetime merely human? If, is your life so short that you are in a hurry to probe for my guilt, to search for my sin? Although you know I am not guilty, no one can rescue me from your power. You formed me with your hands, you made me, and yet you completely destroy me. Remember that I am made of dust. Will you turn me back to dust so soon? You guided my conception and formed me in the womb. You clothed me with skin and flesh, and you knit my bones and sinews together. You gave me life and showed me your unfailing love. My life was preserved by your care. <coughs> yet your real motive, I know this was your intent, was to watch me, and if I sin, you would not forgive my iniquity. If I am guilty, too bad for me. And even if I am innocent, I am filled with shame and misery so that I can't hold my head high. And if I hold my head high, you haunt me like a lion and display your awesome power against me. Again and again, you witness against me. You pour out an ever-increasing volume of anger upon me and bring fresh armies against me. Why then did you bring me out of my mother's womb? Why didn't you let me die at birth? Then I would have been spared this miserable existence. I would have gone directly from the womb to the grave. I have only a little time left, so leave me alone, that I may have a little moment of comfort before I leave for the land of darkness and utter gloom, never to return. It is a land as dark as midnight, a land of utter gloom where confusion reigns and the light is as dark as midnight. And Romans chapter 10. <coughs> Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is that the Jewish people might be saved. I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it is misdirected zeal, for they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Instead, they are clinging to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. They won't go along with God's way, for Christ has accomplished the whole purpose of the law. All who believe in him are made right with God. Salvation is for everyone. For Moses wrote that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of its commands. But the way of getting right with God through faith says, you don't need to go to heaven to find Christ and bring him down to help you. And it says you don't need to go to the place of the death of the dead to bring Christ back to life again. Salvation that comes from trusting Christ, which is the message we preach, is already within easy reach. In fact, the scriptures say, the message is close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart. For if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who believes in him will not be disappointed. Jews and Gentiles are the same in this respect. They all have the same Lord, 
who generously gives his riches to all who ask for them. For anyone who calls on the name of the, Lord, of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is what the scriptures mean when they say, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not everyone welcomes the good news. For Isaiah the prophet said, Lord, who has believed our message? Yet faith comes from listening to this message of good news, the good news about Christ. But what about the Jews? Have they actually heard the message? Yes, they have. The message of God's creation has gone out to everyone, and its words to all the world. But did the people of Israel really understand? Yes, they did. For even in the time of Moses, God had said, I will rouse your jealousy by blessing other nations. I will make you angry by blessing the foolish Gentiles. And later, Isaiah spoke boldly for God. I was found by people who are not looking for me. I showed myself to those who are not asking for me. But regarding Israel, God said, All day long I opened my arms to them, but they kept disobeying me and arguing with me. That is all for today's reading. We'll see you next time.